Yeah, today we're joined by Kate from Kent Food Hubs Folkestone and Rosie from Bow House, who are going to be talking to us about yeah, their experience of um, the pandemic so far, how lockdown is affecting their food hubs and their communities, and just share with us any bits of wisdom or experience or even some of the challenges that they're facing um, as well through, through the, the, the times that we're seeing. Um, so really grateful them, for them to join us today because they also joined us last week for another webinar that we did on seasonal operations and marketing, um, which will be up on YouTube this week if anyone wants to see it. Um, so yeah, thanks again. And so today I was thinking we could start with you, Kate, if that's all right. If you just want to um, share in your own words um, anything that you think um, would be interesting or useful for us. I'm also really interested to hear your experience for how things have been going for you in, in Folkestone being at the epicenter of everything that happened last month. So yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry everybody, we 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 grew a new strain, um, I'm afraid, and then infected you all down here in Kent, which was a bit a bit sad. Um, oh Kate's coming on. Is she here? Yeah. Sorry, no, she's just joining. I think she's just connecting to so from, from Kent Food Hubs from the CIC. So she's about um, 15 miles away from us in Ashford. Um, and so she and I have been working together on the risk assessment and on updating the website and things like that. So she's, hi, Kate. I know you haven't got your video on. And she's, um, yeah, I'm really excited that she's here. Hi. <laughs> So yes, we, we've, been, we've been doing some stuff together. So if, if you feel like joining in, Kate, that would be awesome. Oh, and there's Katie as well. Hi, Katie. She's my fellow director. Hello. So yeah, so we've got lots of um, lots of of, um, of uh, COVID representatives here on the um, conversation today. <laughs> We're very proud there. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, we are um, almost a year old. So we'd we'd only been going for um, about not quite two months when we hit lockdown. So we were just becoming established as a food hub um, when we became really essential to so many people around us. And, and we went from about, I don't know, 20 or 30 boxes, um, orders a week. And within about, I think it took five weeks to go, suddenly go up to 175. Um, so during that time, we also lost our premises um, because it was closed. We were using it at a local venue. Um, they closed that completely. Um, so we, we moved literally three doors up to um, uh, an art exhibition centre. They let us use their space, which is wonderful. Um, but of course, then when the restrictions were lifted again, we were stuck. So um, one of our coordinators, Mel, very kindly, she's lent us her bar, which isn't entirely suitable for us at the moment. But as orders are creeping up again during the third lockdown, um, we've now been offered our original venue back because they are still closed and can't open till June. So COVID has kind of taken away with one hand and then given back with another. So we're kind of operating um, completely in temporary spaces at the moment. Um, we've been chatting to quite a few local um, building owners and, and, and halls and things that we could hire and, and um, maybe go to. But again, everything's so up in the air and, and so are we. I don't know if anyone else has had that experience, but we were we were so new that, that we were going to outgrow our, our venue anyway, but everything got, got rushed. Um, it's been a really strange year because we've been so up and down with our, um, with our sales at the height. We were up at 175 and I know from watching um, the previous um, COVID um, conversation that some of the, the OFN traders felt quite demoralised when people went back to their supermarket um, shopping habits and dropped away. We experienced that here um, and also in Ashford, so like across the Kent food hubs. But we have retained, um, we, we've crept back up again. And I think it's really important to look at like the year as a whole. So this time last year, or almost this time last year, we were running on maybe 20 or 30 orders a week. And we've still come out of it after a year with um, this, this last week, I think we had 91. So we are still, we've still maintained like a steady period of growth. So it's really important to keep perspective of, of how we're doing, I think, despite the craziness that, that's going around. And actually, um, yeah, I mean, 175 orders was amazing, but I'm not entirely sure that would have been sustainable, that the traders were struggling to get those orders to us. We were still packing and delivering up to kind of like half past 10 at night and into the next day, and it was exhausting. So in terms of um, 
steady, sustainable growth. I think it's actually been a really the last two lockdowns, because I think that's how we're measuring time now, isn't it? <laughs> From lockdown to lockdown, um, have been a period of quite steady growth and and actually people have been able to form a like a reliance upon us and a, and a trust and what's really nice is a lot of people now will dip in once or twice a month so we've got kind of you know I'd say about 80 80 or so solid we'll order every week that's great and then probably another sort of 30 or 40 who want to support us who actively want to support us and so whether it be just buying a veg box once a week or doing one shop once a month that that has also been retained and we saw that at Christmas so many of them came back to do their Christmas order with us um, and for the basics as well not just for the luxury items which is really nice um, you know for their for their sprouts and their potatoes they wanted to buy local they wanted like the organic produce they wanted what we had so I think although they're not ordering every week we've definitely retained a customer loyalty and I think it's really important to realise as well, for, we've got such a lovely community here. Um, a lot of our customers are actually buying direct from our very local traders. So they might still be ordering from people who are a little bit further afield, but the actual local Folkestone traders, they're now maybe buying direct from the shop. And that was the point of us to support local traders. So they might not be coming through the hub, but we're still achieving what we set out to do, which is to be there to provide a platform for the local traders. And, and I feel very much that we've done that. So if you look across the board, we've actually hit so many of our, our aims this year. Um, in terms of how it's changed the way we operate, um, obviously masks, um, regular sanitizing, et cetera, et cetera. This last lockdown, we've had, I, I personally found, I, I don't know, um, you know, if anybody else has had this experience, we've had to enforce things a little more. People have become a little com complacent um, because we came through the first lockdown and we were okay. We're having to really rigorously say to people, you have to wear a mask if you're coming in, you need to. Um, and bearing in mind we're in Kent, you know, we're at the epicenter. I don't know if anyone else has that same experience. We're having to sort of like, you know, remind people, remind people on, you know, via the emails or the social media, which has been, a little frustrating and also um, strange because a lot of our customers are very, um, I'm trying to think of how to explain, very ethical, earthy, um, natural people. A lot of them don't believe in COVID. They don't want to wear a mask. And we cannot say to them, when you come to collect your shopping, you have to wear a mask. There's no, we can't do that. We can't enforce it. So we've had to be doubly careful with the, the social distancing when we are actually giving out the boxes like we quite often make sure there's there's two of us so that we can actually keep an eye out for somebody who might be loitering back who's a little bit more nervous moving those customers along who are chatting who aren't wearing masks kind of away from those that are but doing it really really nicely um gently prompting children to um to have um a to keep close to their parents you know not not to be running around um and and sorry, in, in response, Kate, it's actually outside. No one's coming into our premises, so we we can't actually say to anybody. We don't allow anybody in. Um, so we we can't. Sorry, Kate. Kate just messaged say it's a shop, but we, no one comes into our premises. So they're actually outside on the pavement, which makes it even. I didn't make that clear. Makes it even harder to to enforce. So it's it's very different. You've got members of the public walking by, and we don't want to be. We don't want to lose that. Um, really nice relationship that we have with the customers we don't want to hurry them along but equally we don't you know we've got to be mindful that everybody feels dif differently about it I mean we have one really lovely lady who comes come rain come shine um, she's very high risk but she dons all, you can only see her eyes and she comes but she's so determined she lives about 200 yards away and it's her treat is to come and say hello have a small chat pick up her shopping in and leave it's like a little little lifeline to her that and talking through her window to the builders on the scaffolding outside and and you know we don't want to lose that but we are responsible for those for that that period of time so that's that's very different trying to manage everybody's expectations and experiences and and thoughts about it um and Kate and I have been working and and Katie on the on the risk assessments and and constantly updating them um keeping up with current guidance it, it you know it changes on the sixpence so we've all become 
very adaptable is probably the way I'd describe it. And I'd imagine that's that's across the board for all of us. Um, you know, we are very, we're, we're having to change and revise as we go constantly, um, which has been actually really good for practice. It's, it's kept us on our on our toes quite a lot. Um, I've never I've never watched so much television and had so many alerts pinging constantly to see to see what's happening. But on the whole, um, we've operated almost exclusively within the pandemic. Um, so as we are gradually coming out of it, I think we're um, well, as soon as we're in premises, I, I think I think we're really going to hit the round, ground running. I think we've 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 put so much prep in. I don't know what um what Katie or, or Kate think of it. Excuse me. Oliver, turn that off right now. Sorry, my son just put something on YouTube he wasn't supposed to put on. I don't know if you heard him. I think he thinks I've got my headphones in. No. Um, now I've completely forgotten what I was saying. Oh, yes, Katie and Kate. I don't know, don't know what you think, but I think, you know, yeah. like that's i know exactly what you mean there um yeah for, like i i so i'm katie i'm one of the directors of the hub so overall like kate uh but we've got kate, yeah, kate, kate, i'm kate, based in ashford kate. so it's kind of like my domain there um, um oh but shush i'm talking on a call sorry um he's he's weightlifting at the moment <laughs> right um yeah, so when we first started, it was the 12th of March. So people were already starting to talk about COVID, but it didn't seem like an immediate threat. Two weeks later, lockdown happened and things just went off the charts for us. So it was a really steep learning curve. Like we went from about 17 orders in our first week, which we were really pleased and proud of, 20 in the following week to 65 the follow the one after. And then it stayed crazy. Um Oh. Okay. Oh, but can you be quiet? I'm talking. Sorry, he's um he's got my dumbbells, which I don't use. Um, yeah. And then it kind of like Kate was saying earlier, we got really despondent when people started to default back to the supermarkets. It's kind of up, gone up a bit more since Kate is our um Kate G is our um, hub coordinator in Ashford. So I don't know if you want to say anything about that. KG. <laughs> you're only allowed in Ashford Hub if in Kent Food Hubs if you're called Katie okay or you wear glasses or you've got red hair otherwise you just yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, think, I think it was uh, that we, I think we wouldn't have been disappointed with the levels of sales that we have now if we hadn't have had what we had because of the first lockdown so if, we, if this has just been like no lockdown and it was gradually increasing we would have all been fine with it but it's because it's been so up and down it can be very disheartening. Like some weeks are very different to Folkestone. Folkestone's busier than ours than Ashford. Some weeks in Ashford will have like nine orders and it's just the regular people. And that one of those will be me and one of those will be Katie. So it can be um, a bit disheartening. But since, since Christmas, we have slowly but surely I'm seeing new customers come on, returning customers that were shopping with us um, in the summer and now coming back. So hopefully this is a sign of things to come, that they're coming back to us, they're remembering us. We've been hitting social quite hard as well. So hopefully all those little bits and pieces are going to just slowly but surely increase now. If there's a dip now, I'd be more disappointed, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, um, I've just made the decision as well to close my shop for the public. Um, I run a... Um, package free grocery shop a refill shop for dry goods and household liquids and stuff and um yeah i've just decided to, to stay close to the public and just do online and, and hub orders so we'll see how that goes but last i mean last time obviously i i closed during the first lockdown because i had an eight month old baby and i just couldn't cope with the idea of even well actually the premises that I was in at the time closed so I had no choice but to lock down but I was kind of relieved because they could take the decision from my hands because I had the baby and a toddler well preschooler um now I've I've actually closed because the uh decking at the premises that I'm at is is massively dangerous and I fell over today and I don't want my customers falling over but I'm hoping that that drives more traffic to the hub because they'll go on to get my stuff and while they're there, they'll get other stuff and hopefully they'll stay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Awesome. Thanks so much um, for sharing, guys. It sounds like for all of you, yeah, for, for both hubs, just this epic growth um, during these times that we can just really see that your, your kind of adaptability and flexibility is, is definitely a superpower in these times. So yeah, really inspiring. So thanks for sharing. Um, it's an interest, so it's 20 past now. So I wanna, I wanna pass over um, to Rosie from, from Bowhouse to talk about your experience with, with Bowhouse, if that's okay. Yes, hello. Hope everyone's well. Um, that was really interesting listening um, to what all the different restrictions and lockdowns and how it's affected everyone. And I think I can definitely um, agree that we sort of saw a, a kind of a decrease when things in sort of middle of the summer start feeling normal-ish in lockdown environment and um, so we we weren't set up before covid so and um, went back in march last year march yeah and um, everything kicked off and we were sort of um, left with our uh, physical markets not being able to go ahead and lots of our producers that are based um at bow house unable to um sell lots of their products to customers which who would normally be coming in the doors um, and then we had lots of traders on our books who go to uh, farmers markets across Scotland that then had no outlet for their products and they already had um, produce in the fields or or they had things growing or things being produced and then they had no outlet to um, routes to market if you like and um, so we've always wanted as Bow House is, is an actual site, it's like a farm shed that's converted into production units and we've got a big massive shed where we host these farmers markets so we didn't really struggle with space because we were just so lucky and we have this space um, that we can work from and adapt in and um, so we can kind of we kick started really quickly and we're able to just sort of make it work in our environment and um, but things that we've things that have been really tricky is for sure, the the sort of it went mental in the first couple of weeks, and we were like, "Oh my goodness, we've got like seventy orders!" Like, I don't, we don't know what we're doing. We've never run an e-commerce site. We're, you know, events managers. Oh my goodness, what are we doing? To then, um, it then sort of teetering down and being about 40, 35 orders going out the door each Saturday. We were a bit kind of like, "That's okay, like that's fine," but like our staffing cost was obviously there, and our delivery cost was also there, and just trying to manage that the, the basket value was that adding up to enough to justify um, a delivery run to St Andrews for example so it was just trying to figure out all the different how to make it viable and then we went into so it kind of picked up again it was really weird because we've got weekly customers who are super loyal who shop weekly with us and given us amazing quotes and and testimonial pieces and I really love everything that we do and then we've got a sort of fortnightly crowd who do like the stocking up of the dry goods and getting big meat boxes that they then freeze and things like that um, and then we've kind of got our monthly crowd who just forget and are just really honest and like I forgot and now I've remembered and oh my goodness I'm really sorry and they're just kind of scatterbrains just like us just like me to be honest um, so it, we've kind of got a different crowd and then all of a sudden after Christmas was mad and then in the run up to Christmas our weekly orders were mad and then our Christmas order cycle was mad and then all of a sudden this week we've got like 85 orders going to the door and I'm like we've only just woken up into the new year oh, that's quite a lot for us um, and we are really quite rural and um, so delivery runs can be it's been really the only way we can see to expand is to expand our delivery area but because the geographical location of where we are in Fife we're kind of on an elbow of land so we're surrounded in three sides by water so to get to more customers we've really got to go inland towards like Edinburgh or up to Dundee or towards Glenrothes or Dunfermline and um, but it's where to go and when to dive into these new delivery areas and that's a bit of a risk going to these areas which might be an hour journey um, for maybe one box so if you start saying I email the customer just really like personalized email direct and said to them look you're actually out with our, di our delivery area but you've placed a really good order and we really want you to keep ordering with us could you tell your neighbors or do you have any social media pages in your community that you think worthwhile me sharing some information so that when we're delivering to you, we're also saving fuel and delivering to other people in your community who of your friends would find this service useful. 
not yet heard back from them, which is a bit annoying, but I think it takes time, but I think I am going to spend some time to reach out to these people and just be like, we really want other people to have this service and for us, for it to be viable and, and um, worthwhile for us, we need to kind of grow it. And so who wants it basically? And who, what areas are we going to choose? Um, something that we've really struggled with just suddenly is um, yesterday we had six new rules announced all of a sudden in Scotland um, and tighter restrictions even still. So if, all of um, mainland Scotland is in tier four, um, which was um, that people could do takeaway and click and collect services. But then this is all of a sudden being tightened and click and click and collect services and pre-order services are now being clamped down. So every single order has to be given a time slot, which is fine because all of our collection um, orders were given a time slot anyway, but an hour time slot. So now we've had to spend more time to cut down that time slot and say you have to come in your half an hour time slot or you know that's that's gonna have to sit somewhere and then we can't guarantee when we'll be able to serve you and um, we've also you have to serve from a door so from a either outside or from a doorway or a serving hatch which is fine because again at Bow House we've got the luxury of multiple doors in a massive shed leading outside and we've got other areas that we can do it in but again it's just the, the new announcements, one, we get lots of panic emails going, oh, you know, am I going to be able to get my food? What's happening? Da, 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 da. And customers are so worried. The, the, and it's stressful for me and the team because people ask questions before. We've even formulated a thought, thought on it or come up with a plan and we want to go back to them straight away with, don't panic, it's okay. We're just coming up with a plan just now. But, you know, some customer just, because it's changing so much, it's been really tough to keep keep on top of those um those customers that are worried. Um, so those changes that happen so quickly make it really difficult for any business or hub and our traders to kind of react to that. So some of the traders have said to me, oh, Rosie, I actually can't deliver my stock on Friday. Can I drop it off today? And I'm like, well, yes, but I'm actually not on site today because they don't want to do too many, um, they don't want to travel unnecessarily as well. So uh, there's so many, because there's so many people playing their parts um, it can be a bit of a challenge sometimes, but I think, I think back in March, whenever they released a new lockdown notice, we were all like, oh no, what are we going to do? This is a disaster. And now I'm like, oh, what's the new rules? What's the new restrictions? Right, let's just get on with it. Because there's honestly not enough hours in the day or energy or stress to just worry about all these new restrictions. We kind of just, and that's what's so nice about the customers. They are also really understanding. They're kind of like, don't worry if you're, you know, you said you're going to be open this time last week, but that's actually changed really suddenly because of this. People are really understanding. So I think it's okay to, on social media, sometimes we, like I kind of, our, our, the language that we use on social media is quite um, as honest as possible. So quite often I'll, we'll just be like, guys, we got this wrong, like help us work this through. And then actually people are really nice about it and they'll be like, you know, don't worry, you know, we love what you guys are doing. Whereas if you're quite, uh, what well, we, well, we find in the past if we're quite strict and say like this is what we do and um, we're very good at this and da, da 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 but actually if you just put a bit of sort of human feeling towards marketing and social media I think it actually is quite well received and um, well normally it is anyway anyway so yeah it's new restrictions for Scotland has been a bit of a pain in the neck but um, we're kind of used to uh, finding ways around it now which has been good and also stressful, but I don't know if that, if anyone's got any questions, please do shout or any um, help on how to keep up with customers who are panicking. Please do let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for your share, Rosie. That was great. And I really love how you brought in um, and shared your experience with social media. And it's, yeah, it, it's definitely a thing like the more human that you can come across on social media, then people tend to empathize with humans. You're, yeah, undoubtedly gain a kind of a more um, empathic, responsive response from, from your customers. That's a really good insight to share. So thank you so much for that. Um, actually, I was going to say that We've got a couple, so Louise and I are going to do a couple of short um, presentations. Um, presentation sounds really formal, so it's just, I'm going to talk a bit about um, marketing, well, very specifically about communicating um, during COVID and lockdown and ways that you can, you can do that with your marketing. And 
Luis is going to talk about some tips for um, using your OFM platform in, in lockdown as well. So we're going to do two short things with that, and then we should have about 10 minutes um, for questions at the end. If you have any questions um, in the meantime, please drop them in the chat because then we won't forget them and we can get to them straight away at the end. Um, we need to finish on the dot today because sometimes we do go over slightly. Um, and that's because we've got our um, OFN team meeting using the same um, Zoom account. So yeah, we're going to have to keep it to time. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and yeah, so I'm just talking today a bit about COVID conscious marketing and communications um, and seeing different points um, which I can offer to help you with that. So the thing I want to focus on mostly is that during this time, the most important thing to do is establish trust with your customers um, because buying decisions are mostly based on trust and there's a lot of research to back this up. Um, and particularly in these times, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really important thing for your customers to feel like they can they can trust you. And that's also going back to what Rosie said about um, being human and transparent and authentic in your, in your marketing communications. That's a really good way to generate trust because, again, you look like you've got nothing to hide. You're being honest with your customers and that that's a really important thing to do. So there are studies that show that there are three main areas where you can help to generate trust with your customers, which apply to you in, in the kind of um, food production, but also like food facilitation um, space. And one of them is product experience. Another is customer care. And the third is impact on society. And this is based on a recent um, big study on customer behaviors. So I'm gonna talk about each of these individually and link that into what we're talking about here. So first of all, I wanna talk about product experience. So you also touched on this again, Rosie, about what to do if, yeah, how to communicate if there are issues and to kind of almost like proactively know what to say and how hard that is when you're also juggling all the balls. So I guess it's like doing your best. And even if it is in a response or retroactively speaking, it's still really important to wherever you can to manage your customers' expectations, particularly in these times where people are really anxious about whether they're gonna get food or not to manage their expectations around things like supply issues. And as long as you're kind of approaching it with like an empathic, um, positive mindset and where you can a proactive approach, um, this will help to generate customer loyalty because they'll see that you're making this effort to, to understand um, how this issue might be affecting them or how they might feel around potential supply um, issues. So it's really just tackle any issues as soon as you can and preemptively if possible. Um, but obviously that's really challenging if you're juggling all the things. Um, and here's just a few things which, yeah, might be quite simple here, but it's just good things to think about when you're responding, particularly if you've got very anxious customers or customers that might be angry, for example, if there's an issue with their order. It's that remembering where people, understand where people are coming from at the moment and anxiety is unfortunately just one of the things that we're all managing in these times. So it's really important to listen um, clarify and acknowledge that you understand where the customer is coming from and where you can offer a solution. Um, and also use your any any comms um, channels that you have, social media, email, for example, to yeah to help you communicate any of these problems. So, for example, if you know you're going to have a problem supplying some of your customers, consider how you could tackle that issue on your social channels and emails. So. If you're out of stock on a popular item um, due to increased demand, and um, then as long as you help notify your customers in advance um, or even give a preemptive human explanation of how this has happened, it just helps to manage your customers' expectations so they're not as disappointed, um, which will help them to not lose any, any trust um, if they're affected by any, any issues. So it's just exactly as you said, it's just communicating in a human way and yeah, understanding that will also help your customers to empathize with you also as humans. So next slide. So the other thing is this, again, it sounds quite basic, but it's a really important thing to remind ourselves in any communications at any time, let alone during um, a pandemic, is just wherever you can ensure your shoppers feel like a person first and a customer second. And this is something that, um, you, yeah, everyone here today I'm sure does really well, like all of um, the food enterprises that, that I see all the time seem to do this point really, really well. And that's because being a part of the community is embedded in what we're doing, right? So we do see our shoppers more as 
people rather than customers in comparison to say the supermarket. So, and this is important because 79% of customers say that they want the companies that they do business with or buy from to demonstrate that they understand and care about them um, before. And that's before they'd even consider buying with a company, particularly if you want to keep your customers, you want them to really feel like you care about them as people. Yeah, so it's good to just show that you care about them and value them as people with every interaction, particularly in your marketing materials. And again, it's going back to that honesty thing and, and, and being honest with your customers. So I want to talk here about the four C's of COVID. So at the current time, it's really important to keep in mind that the challenges that we're all facing daily around lockdown and COVID and the anxiety that we're all feeling. Um, and for this reason, it's really it, it could be really helpful for you to focus on these four points in your marketing messaging. So that's on your social media and the emails that you put out. It could be on any print flyers, anything at all. It's just cover the you, it's okay to cover these four points. And in fact, it's beneficial to cover these four points because research has shown that these topics or themes are provoking the highest engagement at the moment in, in terms of on social media and yeah, on, online in general. So if you're taught, these are, these are things that people are actively seeking for the companies that they do business with to be talking about, if that makes sense. And there's, there's, there's research to back this up. So the first one, um, so essentially, I want you to see these first words just like a framework that you can use to help you kind of shape your communications. And this also goes back to your question, Kate, in the um, in the chat of how to communicate with your customers on social media. It's a really good idea to be covering these points when you are talking to your customers on on social media. So the first one is cleanliness. Um, be really clear about how you're keeping your customers safe. Um, just don't assume that customers will assume that you've got this covered. Actually, spell it out in your in your comms how you how what steps you're taking to ensure cleanliness in your in your operations is always a good thing. Um, and you could doesn't have to be all the time, but you could maybe do a rolling thing of almost like a reassurance in your social media where it could be you could do a post every every week or every other week even just pointing out what you're doing with on that topic to keep people safe um, the other thing or theme or topic that customers are seeking or can, uh, is information around what you're doing to keep things contactless so it's interesting kate that you brought up that some customers really don't care about this and are looking for that kind of human interaction but as you said there was also then your customer who was kind of hot, like customers that are kind of trying to keep their distance and are really concerned about um, things being contactless and, and safe. So it's good to talk about this, like what steps are you taking to, do, to keep things contactless for your, for your customers, for your suppliers and communicate this in social media and email. So, you know, for example, can, and also it's managing customer expectations too, because can your customers expect um, cues when they arrive if, if not and if you've got staggered collection times then communicate that and that's something that your customers want to hear from you so don't be afraid of talking about these things um, the other thing is yeah yeah just this this just helps your customers that are a bit more more concerned to feel safe shopping with you which is essentially what, what you want to do and it also ties into that thing about being being responsible here um, the other thing is community, and this is where we have in yeah in the the better food systems that we're creating a uh, benefit compared to the supermarkets in that where your hubs are essentially embedded into the community already. So it's a good time in this time to be talking about yeah talking about how you support your community and and shout about some of the bigger issues around the sustainable food movement of why we need resilient local food systems. So, you know, it's it's not directly related to COVID, but this idea of community is currently, a, yeah, people want the companies that they're doing business with to be talking about these things. And this is where we have a distinct advantage compared to the supermarkets to be talking about this. And the final thing is compassion. So, and this is important because again, it goes to that humans interacting with humans thing and, generating trust in, in that way as, as a business by, by being as human as possible. In that, yeah, with all the uncertainty going on at the moment, customer confidence is at an all time low. Um, lots of people have been affected financially as well as probably um, it, 
you know, you don't know any other ways that they might have been affected. Um, people might have lost people, people might be going through quite difficult times at the moment. So yeah, it's when it comes to kind of balancing different customer expectations, it's also understanding that, um, yeah, it's as long as you're kind of approaching things from a compassionate standpoint in your communications, then then you're, you're doing a good job. And yeah, and it's also with things about kind of showing, maybe talking to your customers as well about how you are like managing the issues around customer confidence. Like for example, if customers, if you know that a lot of your customers are concerned about or, or having financial problems at the moment, maybe you could look at doing an essentials box and looking at your range of what to think about ways that you might be able to support those customers or even focus on your messaging on how you provide value for money. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just think using these points to think of different ways that you can make these points relevant to your food enterprise and talk to your customers about these, these topics. So I just want to check the time actually because the time's not showing up on my screen. So can someone please interrupt me if I go beyond 22 because otherwise it might mean into our Q&A time. So talking again about customer confidence. Um, so you really want to use the four C's of COVID in your communications to help your customers to feel safe and secure shopping with you. And it's also, again, it's, it's your customers will feel more understood if you're touching on these topics because you're touching on things that, they, they, that will resonate with them and that they want to know about. And it's a really good opportunity to forge this personal connection with your, with your customers by touching on these four points. So they're a really good way to, to do that. And the final point that I wanted to come to on those three points that I was initially talking about, about how to generate more customer trust in these times and um, using your communications is talk about your impact on society. And don't be afraid to talk about what you believe in as an enterprise. And this can, this it's important to talk about what you believe in as an enterprise around COVID as well, because your customers want to know that you share the same values as they do and care about the same things that they do. So don't be afraid to talk about these, the, the, the actions that you're taking around COVID or that it's important to you to keep people safe. P people want to hear from you that you care about these issues. And I know it might be challenging if you do have customers who have a completely different worldview who think that you know wearing wearing masks isn't a good thing to do or, or some of the you know the the different ways of thinking that we're seeing at the moment and managing as a society um the majority of people are being affected by this and care deeply about it and want to feel safe and want their families to feel safe so it's yeah it's important to really un, yeah align with with these values as a food enterprise and communicate them um even though that might be challenging with customers who have a completely different point of view, it's it's important to communicate what you believe in as a food hub. And then also this generates trust in the long run because when, and hopefully not too long, but when things are, you know, maybe coronavirus becomes a distant memory, I hope that's next month. <laughs> um, but when this does pass, like customers will remember that you kept them safe during the pandemic and that you cared about keeping them safe. This is the kind of trust that you're generating now that will last in the long term and help you keep your customers coming back for more in the long term as well. So it's a really good thing to be doing. Um, and yeah, share, and this goes back as well to the, the four C's of um, community. So share about how you're making a positive impact on your community. And you know, this could also be your, your stories of, of COVID, how you've been able to maintain supply of food to your community during these difficult times it's like don't uh, it, it came up last week about do you know not wanting to use these difficult times as almost like a marketing ploy and it's it's also it's it's sharing your story and how like the the tr trials and challenges that you've overcome as, as a food hub is it's it's it's, it's in a cynical work point of view it could be seen as that but you know it's actually good to be talking about what you're doing and it's and, and talking about your achievements and how you've overcome these challenges and it helps your customers to see what you've been doing for the community and will help them to yeah understand you and to see your enterprise as more human as well which again just generates trust and customers for the long term so i think 
I don't want to overrun, so I think that's it. I just want to point out at the end here is the other thing is talking about community is remember that we as food and like well, we as part of the um better food movement, we're stronger together. So wherever you can, if you can share information with other OFN enterprises as we've been doing today, that's great. And um, we've got a Facebook group if you're not part of it already, please join and um, you can share your experiences there or any eureka moments or things that have made your life easier it'd be great if you could share them um like for example here there's a an example that that louise had come up with for example do you have you found an excellent supplier of face masks like things like this like useful things that might help the community and that's it from me i'm gonna stop sharing and pass over to louise so how much time i've overrun slightly sorry everybody um passing over to you louise Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I, I started um, sharing my presentation before I shared my screen, so sorry I couldn't do that, but um, I just put two links in the chat um, that are sort of relevant to what I am going to talk about now, and I don't want to waffle on too long because I really want there to be time for questions, and um, I just point out now that everything, well pretty much everything that's in my slides um, uh, will be these slides will be available and there's links to click in the slides so you'll be able to access all the information anyway so if I rattle through too fast then um, you can come back and look at these at leisure so I know to start off with that there wasn't there weren't really any rules around um, how to operate a business let alone a food business safely in with the COVID um, outbreak but obviously since um, in the last 10 months there are now quite a lot of advice out there and uh, one of the links I put in the chat was to the Food Standards Agency which has um, relevant advice specific for food industry uh, food businesses and I think if any if you're having a query or doubts in your mind it's well worth having a look. So there's a few things that uh, a lot of people have done and they've used these techniques in the last um, nine months to kind of maybe slightly tweak your open shop front to uh, um, the situation. And um, you may well have heard or seen these slides before or um, heard us talking about them. Um, one of the, I know a lot of our hubs have wanted to support the vulnerable customers, the elderly or maybe those are shielding or um, extremely vulnerable. Um, one of the things that um, hubs did in March and maybe more in March than recently when things there was panic buying and um, they wanted to let vulnerable customers have first choice of their goods was to open their shop front maybe an hour or two earlier for customers that had specific tags or they knew were vulnerable or elderly. Um, I think it's also nice uh, to make makes those customers feel they're special and needed and wanted and um, just nice on a social level as well. So yeah, there's um a link and it's in the how to section of the user guide of how to do this and the that how to is very step by step with um, screenshots so it's not difficult to follow. Um, another thing that we can do if you're trying to work out who should be in this select group that gets to see early or gets to access any of these other privileges you might want to set up is that if you contact the UFN support team we can work out um, how many times a customer has ordered from you in the in the past year or a time frame? So um, if you've got thirty delivery slots and you want to offer them all to vulnerable customers, but you've got forty vulnerable customers, then we can help you sort out who's um, ordered more times, and that would uh, maybe help you prioritise that. Um, and uh, one thing that is really important, I I feel. Um, Per, per, partly just personally is that um, offering delivery or the option of delivery um, to those that should be shielding or um, really need to protect it at this time and obviously um, for some of that some of those uh, might want to go out but it's really not in their best interest or for other reasons um, you might want to offer them a slightly reduced rate to what you would offer for delivery to another customer and you can operate this uh, via tagging and there's um, again there's a how to in the user guide to set this up. Um, in terms of um, supporting the vulnerable another way you can do it is through um, a phone buddy system 
Um, I know a lot of hubs did this in March and April. Um, and what I mean by phone buddy is that you might know there's elderly or vulnerable in the community that don't have internet access, or perhaps they just don't like placing orders on the internet. A lot of people have um, anxiety about that. And when they're anxious about COVID anyway, that's just a step too far. Um, so what you can do is um, phone them up and uh, take an order over the phone. And uh, there's a, a there's a link here to how to do this, as well as a video to how to teach people how um, volunteers to do it. And from a personal level, I think that it's really nice because um, a lot of these customers, that, well, some people might not see anyone else, they might not talk to anyone else in the week, and just offering them a phone call, uh, even if they only buy like a small amount, I think it just shows that you're part of the community and you really care. Um, it's not all towards monetary gain. It, but there again, they might tell their neighbours who might spend more. So it, yeah, I think it plays in your favour, whatever way. Um, for regular customers, um, maybe if a customer orders almost the same each week, you could offer them a subscription rather than, um, than place the order. They can always um, add a, in an extra order each week and top up the, what they buy. But having um, that subscription helps with customer retention. Um, and reduces their anxiety. And also it gives your suppliers sort of um, a guaranteed minimum income for it because they know they're getting so many subscriptions coming in. And if you if this is something you don't offer at the moment and you're interested, then um, just drop the support team an email and we can have a talk through and help you set it up. Um, you can obviously, um, I use your, there's a couple of places where you can put notices to customers about wearing masks and all the rules and social distancing and what to expect, just so that they are like 110% clear and you've made yourself clear. One of them is on your shop notices tab and the other one is in your shipping information or your delivery information. You could, there's a description box and you can write all this in there. And then a couple of practical tips, and I'm sure you're all masters of food enterprises far more than me by now. Uh, well, not just by now, you are anyway. So um, really things like setting your stock levels to absolute ever, um, stock to absolute rather than infinite so that you sell out rather than over promise uh, just helps with customers expectations. Um, I think especially this time round when the cases of COVID are so high, um, and also with track and trace, and it's very possible that a supplier is being in close contact with someone and then has to self-isolate for that reason. Um, I think it's probably worth your while in terms of time management, everything, checking with your suppliers every week before you open an order cycle, just check that they're okay. And, you know, I think that will really help. Um, and then think about the number of maximum orders you can fulfill in a week, not just um, stock levels. As Kate um, said from Kent, it, like running at, uh, I think it was 175 orders a week, what I think you said, was just, uh, they could do it one week, but it wasn't sustainable in the long term. It, um, so if you do reach that kind of maximum number of orders you can process don't be afraid to shut your order cycle early rather than accept more and then sort of mess up not mess up but you know not fulfill your customers expectations in a way you would like to for everybody for everybody um and it's always better to soft close rather than hard close and there's an explanation in the in link in these slides which you'll get later and um, another thing is, is if you want us to help you work out when you reach that limit to the number you can of orders you can um, process, then do just um, drop us an email. We can potentially sort that. Well, we can sort that out for you or set you up with an email notification. Right. Um, I think in the interests of um, sort of getting some space for some questions. I'm gonna close now. There's only one thing that I wanna point out that if you go on the government um, website, they've got some pre-made social media images. Now you obviously don't wanna put them on your social media all the time, but um, I think in terms of showing that you are following the rules and you really care, it might be something you wanna drop in once every couple of weeks or whatever. And they're pre-made, so, um, it saves you time making images. So there's a link in, this, in the chat as well as in these slides to get those. Um, it's 
entirely up to you, but it's just something that I found the other day and I thought it might be handy. So what I'm going to do now is um, stop, stop sharing my screen and um, pass over to everyone else for questions and Kay. Thanks so much, Louise. Yeah, we've got five minutes questions. Sorry, that was totally my fault, but we'll share the slides in the Facebook group. And the next session that we do on lockdown will probably be more of a Q&A, mostly Q&A session. So we'll have um, a different type of approach to things next time. But yeah, are there any questions for any of our speakers or for each other? Um, Kate Smith? Um, Louise, what's the difference between a hard close and a soft close? Um, a hard close would be where you um, just change the the end date of an order cycle so that it was in the past. Um, if a customer is in the process at that moment of checking out, it will mean that they'll lose their order. Um, I mean, it'd have to be like within seconds of each other, but it, it, did, it did happen in March and April, believe it or not, people were that manic um, buying. Um, a soft close would be that if someone is in the process when you um, change the orders, uh, when you cut it, it's done by tags, but when you shut the order cycle, it means that if people are in the process of paying, they won't lose their order. Um, there is a link in the user guide in the how to section of how to do that and an explanation. Um, and there's a link in the slides afterwards that I can share with you. It's only a minor difference, but it, and it probably won't matter if, unless you've got like major, major panic buying stakes. Thanks, Louise. And thanks for your question, Kate.